Welcome back, everyone, to Ramdas Here and Now. I'm Raghu Marcus, the host of the podcast. Uh, now we have a podcast from, what is it, June 1978. And I keep thinking, boy, given all of what's gone on here with Ramdas leaving us at the end, uh, you know, what, six weeks ago or something, that there's all of this material, all of these talks, audio, video, that we have still not combed through all of it, and we keep finding all of these gems. It's, just, it's pretty graceful. However that happened, I don't know who, Ramdas, I don't know if he initiated all of this. I think different people came and said, hey, we're going to record this. Okay, good. And here we go, 50 years later, or more. What am I talking about? 52 years. I mean, he's, it's 1968 he started when he came back from India. This talk that Ram Dass gave back in 78 was around social responsibility and the Shaker Town Pledge. Have you ever heard of the Shaker Town Pledge? I, I think dimly I heard of it, you know, but... I really wasn't familiar with it, and uh, this is just, and this is uh, represented by the Quakers, and, you know, the Quakers have that great meditation where you tune into that st still, small voice within. Yeah. And this is another great thing that Ram Dass did. He just... He put himself into as many different traditions as possible and, and absorbed them. And then so much of his work is, is just really part of what Maharaji gave us, Neem Karoli Baba, when we first went to India, and he'd say, Subek, it's all one. Ramdas really put the time in to check that out experientially through these different traditions. Very, very uh, wonderful that uh, that he did that and that we can share that. Um, so apparently the uh, Shaker Town Pledge, it's a nine-point pledge. And uh, again, I had never really gotten into this in a way that I understood what exactly they were talking about. Uh, and it is central around social responsibility, but much more than that. And uh, the first point is to realize we are world citizens. So um, in the end, though, it becomes obvious from an experiential base that what else is there? But we are world citizens. We, especially today, how we are in touch digitally and through the net, and we are in touch with each other in a way that really has never happened before over these last uh, 20, 30 years, 20 years. So uh, that concept is, uh, it's one that I think in my own experience when I just hear the phrase, world citizen, it's something that offsets the deep polarization and it's something that can be cultivated and certainly needs to be from an experiential base, from which everything becomes obvious that we are interconnected. Uh, number two, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but just some of them uh, that really just ticks the boxes off for me. Uh, here's, is, and not in any order, a leading a life of creative simplicity. Right? Is that something that anybody thinks about? Creative simplicity. So that it's not like you're giving up stuff just to do it, to become simple. But the, the life force of, of creative day-to-day relationship with uh, with everything with our planet with the people in it and and 
we show by example that there is a way for us to live that is less complex than the one we are being shoved into by virtue of the kind of uh, social atmosphere that we're in, political atmosphere that we're in, um, short-term attention stuff that we're in. So just, I think this would mean some a different thing maybe to everybody, but leading a life of creative simplicity is... It's it's a it's a concept to really think about for a minute that might help turn us around a little. And I um, I think in this talk, uh, this lecture, Ramdas also uh, talks about uh, just the the way that we end up living a dharmic life because that's all there is to do. And I think that has a lot to do with the idea of creative simplicity. It has to do also with right livelihood, which is one of these nine points of the Shakertown Pledge. Um, and here's one that I, I went, wow, it made me think of this experience that I had. This, this uh, pledge is affirming the gift of my body. And uh, he references how, how busy we are with the spiritual path and spiritual trip, and we disdain whatever around the body because that's lower. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very low on the totem pole of us to care about. Now, so this made me think because I was fortunate enough Back in the day, actually, with Maharaji, that w one day I was, I had to go down to Delhi to get a new passport. And it was one of these moments that Maharaji said to me, you've just been with a Tibetan Lama? And I said, no, I've never met a Tibetan. You sure you don't mean the Buddhist teacher was going to teach us meditation up in the Himalayas? Nay, Tibet, Tibet Lama gave you teachings for 45 minutes or something like that, he said. Anyhow, of course, the next thing I know, I was in a, a eating lunch with Kalu Rinpoche <laughs> the next day, uh, and um, who is or was one of the great lamas of the last uh, 100 years. And he took me into a room, uh, along with a few other people, just a darshan, and uh, actually, it was with some uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation um, radio personalities, and they asked him a bunch of dumb questions. So they looked at me and said, "Why don't you ask him something?" And I did. And out of that conversation, he gave me this darshan for you know half an hour, forty minutes, whatever, on several different subjects. And one of them was, "Take care of your body." You do not understand that it does not come that easy and that often in terms of when you die and go into, through the bardos. There are many, many different planes that people, that souls, or, you know, of course the Buddhists wouldn't call them souls, that, that Buddha mind lands on. And it's not necessarily this plane. And he said, this plane is the only plane that we can get free this is the only plane of consciousness, the physical body, in, through which we, be, we can become free, free of all of our greed, anger, lust, blah, 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 so that we can be of some use to other people and not be so self-involved. So, so he really instilled in me uh, to consider the... the seriousness of that reality and you know I mean everybody could say oh yeah well and I I really trust the Tibetans version of reality I really do so when he told this to me I I very much took it to heart now have I done the right thing all these years well not always but we are trying, all of us, aren't we? 
another one of these uh, points is a relation uh, to others, uh, being true to each other. So I, of course, these days with what happened, Ramdas leaving and so on, that has mm-hmm. become so really, really uh, super important, the way that we relate with each other being true to each other. Very difficult stuff many of the time because we are so trained to protect many different parts of ourselves. And then when we do that, then we create polarization with whoever it is that we are around. And now's the time, I mean, for us going through not just Ramdas leaving, but his Indian brother K.K. Shah, who was a an extraordinary mentor for uh, those of us that were, well, actually not just for those of us that were there back in the day, but the many people, I mean, KK has come to a number of retreats in the last number of years while we were in Maui and doing these retreats with Ram Dass, Krishnas Jack and Roshi Halifax and Trudy and Mirabai Bush and all of us. So, He is known by many and loved by many, many people. So I'm just emphasizing the the loss has been amplified, certainly, even though many people who are listening to this podcast right now may not know who KK is. Uh, Oh, there will be next week after the memorial, uh, there's a beautiful article about KK that has several contributions uh, from people who first went to India like Krishnadas um, and met Maharaji only because KK forced the issue with Maharaji. So, um, yeah, just put that in the back of your head. I think people will enjoy um, finding out who he is. And we are doing a movie, Love Server Member Foundation. We have shot some incredible footage a couple of years ago, thank God we did it, uh, to really pass on the uh, the grace that he was a a, a a connector for in many many different ways. Uh, so yeah, you know, one day we do a podcast with um, one of these here and now podcasts and really uh, talk about KK and what he really meant to us and what he passed on to us. So it's been really, really difficult, and the fact that we have each other and the way in which we do come together in in this particular circumstance in such a wide, open, heartfelt manner um, is is a a great, great bomb, B-A-L-M, for us. It's a solve the way that we connect with each other, the way that we can open up with each other in truth. So, yeah. I love that, that one of their pledges. Um, and they have some other stuff, for, you know, around... Oh, Ram Dass has a great, you know, white lie story that he tells that I won't ruin for y'all. Um, and another thing that's uh, seemed important... As, as one of the pledges, is called personal renewal. You know, we need to do that. We need to renew our connection with that true part of us. And uh, so in that light, I mean, it, it's, of course, not always available for people to be able, for instance, to go to India, which is a thing that I have done for a long time as a retreat uh, almost on a yearly basis. But let's talk simple stuff, like just going out into the forest, into nature, and just mindfully absorbing the air and the sky or the ocean. So renewal is, you know, I know that, um, again, I keep referring to what's gone on here in the last five or six weeks with these, with the passing of Ramdas and KK. I have needed that. Uh, 
uh, we moved to Ojai, as many of you know. So we're going to uh, set up a uh, headquarters, so to speak. We don't know quite how it's all going to develop, but it's a, a beautiful area, and it's got a very pristine vibration, certainly appropriate for any kind of spiritual work. And just walking in the hills there in the mountains is um, has been a total feeling of renewal by just doing that. So, you know, super important stuff. And Ram Dass goes through all of the different uh, pledges. And, um, and of course, he tells some of his, uh, he tells a fun story about what Maharaji got him to do. And it had to do with the, the way in which we tell white lies because um, we don't want to hurt anybody. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And uh, Maharaji really called him out on that. Um, so another talk that is something I don't think anybody's heard Ramdas talk about, the Shaker Town Pledges. You know, it sounds like a song. And that I love the uh, the idea of the meditation on the still small voice within. So the, here you go. This is Ram Das from, again, June 78, around social responsibility and just uh, these nine pledges that help help us to live, as I like to call it, a life in balance. So again, everybody, um, take a look at ramdas.org. Try and find the, there will be a link or you can put your email address in. Um, and, you know, we do all sorts of uh, wonderful uh, offerings and for free. We have uh, some interesting ones coming up. So it is great to have you as part of the community. So please do sign up. And those of you who have signed up, who are listening to this podcast, and there's a lot of you, uh, and you say, I don't get any of these, that's because you probably got them in the spam bucket. So you just go in and turn that spam off on the stuff that comes from uh, ramdas.org, love, serve, remember, okay? And I will see you next week, well, not next week, in a couple of weeks with another Ramdas here and now. Just go to uh, BeHereNowNetwork.com and take advantage of the host of incredible teachers and thought leaders and podcasts. And we're adding on new people uh, that uh, we're going to be announcing very shortly. So we shall see you next week. Namaste. Now, the Quakers for many years have been a group that has primarily been concerned with social responsibility. And it's interesting that their root is the meditation on the small voice within. And if you have been to a Quaker meeting, you know that at a Quaker meeting, people sit quietly and go within to hear. And then each person is the minister and speaks as that speaks through him. And while the Quakers have done incredibly good things, and they have, there is a quality of righteousness about the Quakers, which is their limit, but it's also kept them doing good things. And there is a lightness about their righteousness in general. They've done it pretty lightly. And uh, several years ago, they came together, a group of Quakers came together, and they came up with what was called the Shaker Town Pledge. And you can just listen to it. It's just nine points. And just hear about the quality of your own life in relation to it. First one is, I declare myself to be a world citizen. Now, here are the levels of it. They're saying it from one level. How different it is when you have meditated into the place where you see that all human beings are yourself. Then you would say, well, obviously I'm a world citizen. But it wouldn't be an intellectual understanding. It would be a, an obvious thing from your experiential base. Two, I commit myself to lead an ecologically sound life. Well, if you realize the world is your home and you spoil your home, then like Tim Leary says, well, we've spoiled the nest. We've got to go into outer space. 
but you get so that you recognize. I remember giving a lecture in Berkeley one night, and it was beautiful, and everybody was full of love, and these flower children were all there, and they got out, and they got into their Volkswagen microbuses and went down the road, and I found myself behind one of these buses, and on the back it said, love and peace, and God is good, and joy is light, and all those things you stick on the back of buses. And we stopped at a red light, and suddenly, it was a cold night, the windows were up, I saw the guy, the driver, rolling his window down, and I saw him throw out a, uh, a, an old used, uh, I think he was drinking a milkshake or something, he threw the cup out the window. And there was something that went through me, it was just like he stuck a knife in me. Who was this being who was so full of love for everything, and yet he could do what he just did, which was an act that was totally mindless. And I'm always, it's almost like a cue to consciousness when you watch somebody take a stick of gum and drop something, you know, or, you know, you just notice, you know, you get so that you're not sitting around judging, you're just odd that because once you begin to see that it's all your own backyard, what the hell are you going to do? I mean, it gets, it gets the same way with stealing. I mean, I remember uh, I was living in New York City a few years ago and I had a car and I put a stereo system in the car. And I was living up on Riverside Drive. On a, I had an office up on Riverside Drive. And one night, the stereo got ripped off. <clears throat> and I came out the next morning, and I looked, and there was the stereo gone. And I was amazed at what my reaction was. I really was amazed, because in the past, I would have been absolutely freaked. Furious and angry and... Rawr, and I mean, that was a $200 operation there. All I felt was this incredible sadness for the person that had done it. So I took my sadness and I took it to a stereo place and I put another stereo in. And the next week, probably the same guy took the same thing. I came out and the stereo wasn't there anymore. Well, Maharaji, come on, don't push me so hard. You know? All I felt was the sadness. Because you begin to see, <laughs> but then I didn't put any more in. I just went without a, without a radio because who needs it, you know? I mean, I, I had to have two messages before I let go. But you can feel like I watch as my father leaves his apartment. There are three locks on the door. And if you don't lock one of those locks, there is a, what are you trying to do? Yeah. It's just a world in which everything is locked. You've got to be very careful. Now, it is true that if you leave a key in a car on the street, you have the karma on your head if somebody steals it because you're asking, you're pushing somebody in their desire system. You're taunting them. You're pulling it from them. But how much energy do you put into the paranoia of life? And if you steal from somebody, aren't you stealing from yourself? And aren't you just creating the paranoia that is the what makes your life hell in the first place? So you end up e leading an ecologically sound life, both psychologically and physically, because it's the obvious thing to do, not because of any great moral thing on your part. It's like courage. People say, isn't he courageous? Or isn't she courageous? And if it's said about you, you say, I wasn't courageous. I was just doing what I do. To an outsider, it looks like courageous. The captain goes down with a ship, not because he's saying I'm courageous, just because he's so trained as a captain, he can't get off the ship. Three, I commit myself to lead a life of creative simplicity and to share my personal wealth with the world's poor. That's an interesting one. <laughs> creative simplicity. Gandhi's statement, civilization is the art of voluntary renunciation where you would rather do without it than have it and have the paranoia and create that haves and have nots and all that stuff that goes with it. At one point, Maharaji called me before him and he said, Ramdas, your father has money? And I said, yes. He said, he's going to leave you a big inheritance? He said, yes. He says, you're not to accept it. <laughs> and there was a place in me, you see, that said, well, I'll be a yogi. What the hell? What difference does it make? I'm going to inherit a lot of money. You know, I can always become a gentleman farmer later. I'll have plenty of bread. And suddenly he just pulled the rug right out from under me. And I went back to America full of this knowledge that I couldn't accept my inheritance. 
And I met my father and suddenly I found myself meeting my father in a whole new way because no longer was there that little subtle place in me that knew his staying alive was keeping me from having that easy life of all that money. And suddenly I could love him and want him to stay alive in an honest way, not with all that kind of guilt and confusion about it. And I couldn't tell him that because he had lived his whole life to get the money for me. And that would have undercut the justification for his life. You don't have to go out of the way to hurt people. But to me, that isn't my money anymore. And when the inheritance comes, it'll probably go to the Hanuman Foundation or some other nutty thing like that. <laughs> it's not my money anymore. And I just don't live as if it's my money or as if I have anything coming anymore. And I realize now what that freed me of. I'm not saying everybody should give up inheritances. It means you have to, if you have money, you have the, as I said, you have the karma and the responsibility for that money. For I commit myself to join with others in reshaping institutions in order to bring about a more just global society in which each person has full access to the needed resources for their physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual growth. That means you accept your part in the society and you work to make the social institutions e equitable for all human beings in terms of wheat deals and all kinds of stuff. And it merely means that when you get the chance, and I don't go necessarily looking for things to do because I have my own work doing this. But when something comes up, when Wavy Gravy calls me and says, look, when the Biafra drought was going on and he calls me and he says, Look, there's an organization in New York that isn't ripping off people, that actually gets the money to be opera, and they can keep a human being alive for 10 cents a day. And I hear that, and that pulls on my heart, and whatever is in my checkbook, I give, and that goes to be opera, and that's right, and I'll do a benefit or whatever. And then I come along, and we're in California, and the Greenpeace people call. And they say, look, the whales are very conscious and beautiful beings, and what are we doing wiping out? the last of a breed. What kind of a thing is that? And would you help? Yes, part of Marin County will be a benefit for Greenpeace. I don't go looking, but when it comes, you listen and your heart hears what you have to do. I commit myself to occupational accountability, and in so doing, I will seek to avoid the creation of products which cause harm to others. That's about right livelihood. I guess that means you wouldn't make napalm bombs. You wouldn't make things that would be imposed on other human beings. You could make things that don't necessarily raise consciousness, but as long as they are voluntarily available, like you could make television sets. doesn't necessarily raise anybody's consciousness, but it's their choice to turn it on or off. I affirm the gift of my body and commit myself to its proper nourishment and physical well-being. You begin to see what I did for years was I was so busy with my spiritual trip, I just denied my body because I didn't like it. And I finally realized that's my temple in which I'm doing my work. And if you don't sweep the temple, you got problems. And so now I take care of my body, what I feed it, how it sleeps, medical treatment, it's exercise. I'm conscious that it's part of my whole honoring my incarnation. I commit myself to examine continually my relations with others to, to attempt to relate honestly, morally, and lovingly to those around me. Truth is a funny thing. Truth gets you free. Truth gets you high, it gets you free. Risky business. But it changes the whole name of the game. I was in Allahabad. Maharaji kept catching me on the way I'd lie all the time. I didn't lie any more than you lie. I, was, I tell social lies called white lies for some reason. You know, just those little ones that don't hurt anybody. They just make everything. They make the social game, they lubricate it so it goes more smoothly. Okay. Like one day his uh, daughter's sister-in-law was up with Maharaji and Maharaji said, um, Ramdas, you remember her? And I didn't remember her because I just didn't remember her. And I said, oh, yes, of course, is the way he said it. And he said, this is Dada's sister-in-law. And then I wasn't good or smart to leave well enough alone. I said, oh, yes, we met in Allahabad because Dada comes from Allahabad. I figured if it's a sister-in-law, I must have met her there. She says, no, no, we met up here at Kenshin. Maharaji knew he had me. 
And he picked up his finger and he went like that, like, watch it, baby, cut out that line, you see. So a few weeks later, we were in Allahabad, and um, we were sitting in a room, and there was a judge or a, a clerk of a high court, of the high court, which Allahabad's the capital of Uttar Pradesh, it's one of the states in India. And Maharaji suddenly was telling this man about me, like, this is Dr. Alpert from Har, and he'd never done that before. I mean, I never even knew he knew all that junk, and he was telling it all like it was very important. And the man was very impressed. This was a great pundit from America. And finally, he said, well, perhaps, the man said to me, perhaps, sir, you would like to visit the Supreme Court. Now, I come from a family of lawyers, and if there's one thing I didn't really want to do was visit the Supreme Court. I came to India to find God, not not men's minds, but you know, he's put it that way and it's in a social situation. Everybody's waiting for my answer. And I said, oh, that would be lovely. You know, that's just a, now that isn't even a, just a little bit of a white lie, right? So he said, uh, well, tomorrow at 10. <laughs> so I thought, uh oh, I'm getting trapped. So I said, well, you have to ask my guru. I figured he'll get me off the hook. He doesn't want me going to supreme worldly places like Supreme Court. So he says, Maharaji, can Ramdas go to the court? Maharaji says, if Ramdas says it's lovely, it'll be lovely. See? And he goes like that to me. See? So the next day I go to the Supreme Court and I go through the whole routine and I see a murder trial in the libraries and all this. And it's an interesting day. And, and I end up in, at one point, I'm in the, um, the room where the Bar Association is. All the lawyers are hanging out and they're all wearing black gowns with, you know, their whole scene. And... Um, they see me come in with this important official, and I'm an American, and so they come over to me and they ask me <clears throat> about the meaning of Nixon's China policy with regard to India. So I've read Time magazine, so I'm very <clears throat> scholarly about everything, and so I explain to them about power blocks in Egypt and Russia and da 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 da, and, and um, they're all very impressed, and I, I do my Harvard professor snow job, I call it. And then I go back to Maharaji, and Maharaji says, well, what happened to the court? He's like a Jewish mother. What happened? So what happened? So I said, well, I went to the court, and I, and I started saying, I went to a murder trial. He said, and there were two judges, and he, he kept jumping ahead as if he, was, he knew the story already. He was just prodding me, get on with it, you know. So I told him the story. I said, but Maharaji, it's a very worldly place. And he says, yeah, T, very good. Like, I just recited my thing properly, and, you know, I'm a good boy, and go away. So that evening at Darshan, at Maharaji's Darshan, there's a big crowd gathered as usual, and one of the men, he looks like a, a spy print. He looks like the perfect caricature of a lawyer, and he's got long ears, ears and long face, a horse face, and he's, you know, he really looks like a lawyer. And he comes up to me and he says, um, we had a meeting this afternoon, and we'd like to invite you to speak to the um, Bar Association and to speak to the Rotary Club of Allahabad. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to end up on the cream vegetable circuit of India. You know, I mean, it's, that's uh, the horror of life, believe me, to speak to those things. That, you know, it's a club people come to. They don't care. You could be speaking about, uh, you know, the Russian fishing grounds, and it wouldn't make any difference. It's just a speech. So I learned my lesson, though, you see. I mean, it's taken me. I'm a slow learner. But I said to him, well, I don't want to do either one of them. But if my guru says, I must, I will, I'll do anything he says. So he says, okay, well, I'll go ask Maharaji. I'm sure he'll want you to do it. So he goes up to Maharaji and he presents the problem to Maharaji. And Maharaji seems ecstatic. <laughs> he says, Ramdas is going to speak to the Rotary Club? The bar is left. We finally made the breakthrough into respectability. I mean, it was just bizarre. I thought, my God, Maharaji is just a... He's just a hustler, and he's just exploiting me, and what is this about? And he kept turning all his devotees and saying, Ramdas is going to speak to the Rotary Club, and the bar associate, Ramdas is going to speak to the bar, and the guy, the lawyer, is beaming and looking at me, see, I told you so, I mean, Maharaji knows the values, see? So Maharaji calls me up, Ramdas, come here, come on. So he says, you're going to speak to the Rotary Club and the bar associate? I said, Maharaji, your grace, whatever you say, I'll do. He says, uh, what are you going to talk about? Well, I had gotten that far, you know. So I thought quick, and I thought, well, law, law, dharma, dharma, law, law. I said, I'm going to speak about law and the dharma. He says, acha, good. He says, um, are you going to speak about Christ? 
the way he said it, I said, uh, of course, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and he said, um, are you going to speak about Hanuman? I said, oh, absolutely. <laughs> and he said, uh, are you going to speak about me? I said, well, of course. Could you imagine my not speaking about me? The lawyer is getting a frown. See, long run. He says, well, we kind of thought that Dr. Alfred would talk about Nixon China policy. Maharaj, he looked horrified. He says, you couldn't trust him with that. He doesn't know anything about that. He can only talk about God. I said, that's right. I only talk about God. <laughs> and the lawyer says, well, I'll tell you, perhaps it would be better if I had a few lawyers over to my house to talk with you. I think maybe it would be better if you didn't talk to the Rotary Club and the legal society, the bar association. And I suddenly got the message, and Maharaj was just sitting there laughing and watching me. And he says, no, Ramdas only speaks about God. And I realized my out in life. I only speak about God. And it's interesting that wherever I go to give lectures about healing and life and death and politics and all, I just speak about God. And I understand that in that way, I can stay closest to my own truth. And it's a truth that excludes me from a lot of things, but that's okay. As Gurdjieff said, when you start a change, a lot of people will find you boring. But as he said, that's only the beginning of it. Because actually, most of the people you had business with, you end up having no business with. They don't want to talk about God. They want to talk about Nixon's China policy. I can watch in this group as I go around, like late at night, go into the kitchen or walk uh, in and hear conversations going on here and there, that what this is like a little bit for most people, it's like pumping up a tire in which there's a leak in it. And you get all into these God spaces and then you go and you hear people and they're talking about very, very worldly things. And I think we have to have a lot of compassion for our predicament. I mean, I noticed what happened to me in India. In India, you're, there was a time when I didn't even know who was president of the United States because the election had occurred and there was no news and I was in a temple and how would I know? There's no radios or anything. And I thought, isn't this bizarre? I don't know who the president of the country is. And I remember there's a psychologist giving tests in mental hospitals <laughs> where one of the questions was, who's the president of the United States? And if you didn't know, you were considered crazy. And there I was. <laughs> I commit myself to personal renewal through prayer, meditation, and study. Number eight, coming back to the base camp. I commit myself to responsible participation in a community of faith. Now, all these things which are pledges and vows, just like the Ten Commandments, which are commandments, all that stuff, after a while, just becomes obvious. So you end up living a dharmic life because it's obvious. It's just intuitively the way it has to be. You don't end up doing it always because somebody tells you to, or you're afraid of being bad, or you're trying to get enlightened. You end up finally meditating because you yearn to sit down and shut up for a while. You end up walking into a department store and walking through it and finding out there's nothing you want. I mean, I went to Bangkok where, uh, and to, after India, you live in India where there's hardly, you know, it's very sparse. And then uh, we went to Bangkok. <laughs> and I get to Bangkok and, uh, God, the department stores and everything's there. Everything that you're sitting in India saying, oh boy, if I could, I'd have this. And that, and you walk through and you look at it all, and it all looks like just stuff. And you figure, I got to buy something because I had all that stuff in me, that desire to buy. I've got the money. Why don't I buy it? You find you just don't want so much stuff. It's like, what do we do tonight, Marty, if you remember that movie? You know, well, I don't care. What do you want to do? Well, I don't care. We got to do something. I mean, you got to do something. Maybe we won't do anything. Maybe we'll just sit and watch the sunset and be together. But you can't. Be phony about these processes. Vows and pledges are all just a little bit phony. They're nice, but they're a little bit short of the mark because you're always pitting yourself against yourself. It's good discipline, 
but it's much greater to have deepened your being to the point where it is obvious. It is obvious that you help other human beings. It's obvious that you live simply. It's obvious that you quiet your mind. It's obvious that you open your heart. It's obvious that you're a world citizen. It's obvious that you're living in a world created by God. It is obvious that you are God. It's a whole different way. That's what it means to live a dharmic life. You're living the obvious. Really, you're living the obvious. When I come to a place where I don't understand what I'm supposed to do next, I merely conclude that I'm apparently not in the right place because in the right place, it would all be obvious. So I just quiet my mind some more. And if I can, I put aside the decision. And if I can't, I can flip a coin because it doesn't matter. Shall I have another retreat or not? Well, we'll see. Heads we do, tails we don't. I don't know whether I'm supposed to have any more retreats or not. Should I go into a cave for the rest of my life? I don't know. Most of the things just sort of hang and wait because you don't know. And at some moment it becomes obvious what you're supposed to do next. It becomes as obvious as when you need to go to the toilet and you've got the runs. Believe me, there's no problem. You know just what you've got to do next. Well, it becomes just like living with the run. You know, really. Really. It tells you exactly what needs to be done next. And there's no problem at all because you can hear it. When somebody falls in front of you and they're hurt and they're crying, you help them up. Francisco was telling me that when he applied to this retreat, that his money, his check was sent back and he was told that it was full. And he was very sad because he wanted to come here. And he was on the subway in New York. And the subway broke down on the way to 96th Street. And it was a very hot day. And a woman passed out on the subway. And everybody was just standing watching. And he went over and he sat with her. And then when they finally, after 45 minutes, came to a place, and two policemen came, one went to get an ambulance and one brought water. And he took water and he was washing her face. And she said, oh, that feels so good. And he was just in that relationship because there she was. And she just needed somebody. And he was just there. He was just on the subway. He wasn't looking to heal and he wasn't a healer. He was merely there. And she said, that feels so good. And then the ambulance came and they took her away. And he went home and there was a telephone call right afterwards from Lama saying there was space. He says, I don't know that there's a relationship, but... It felt that way. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't push it, but I think that it's... I mean, I wasn't as interested in the, the telephone call from Lama as just as I was as the act that came out of a natural place within his being. To me, that talks a lot about his spiritual evolution. That it didn't seem like anything special for him to do. It was just what he does. The way he is as a human being. The minute you think what you're doing is special careful. The minute you think you're helping somebody, careful, because you've just created somebody that needs help. People come to see me in the interviews full of their predicament and their problems and their sadnesses and all that, and I just look at them as beings who have incarnated, and this is their karma. The karma is talking to me, but there's the human being right here, and we're together. This being and I are together, and I say, heavy, isn't it? I remember a woman coming to see me once and she just was telling me about her daughter and how her daughter was really ruining her life and had <clears throat> forged the check of her sisters and had left home and, oh God, she, it took about 15 minutes to chronicle all the horror. And she said, and she had been along with that child since she was six months old, the baby was six months, she had raised her working as a bookkeeper all those years in Franklin, New Hampshire. She got all done, and I looked at her, and I was just sitting doing Om Mani Padme Om, Om Mani Padme Om, and hearing this stuff come out. Got all done, I said, right, and here we are. She said, but you don't understand. And she told me the whole story all over again. Because she wanted to make sure that I really was caught in it the way she was caught in it. And I got all, she got all done a second time, and I said, right, I hear it. Very heavy. Here we are. And she immediately flipped. And she said, well, you know, I was kind of a hellion in myself when I was a child. <laughs> and she just 
gave up the role immediately because there was nobody feeding it. And yet I was right there with her, with love. There are no helpers and there's nobody to be helped and there's nobody dying and there's nobody being born. And there are no bad guys and there are no good guys. It's just being. Live in the world of being. It just is much freer. And then do what you do. And the deeper your quietness and the deeper your connectedness, the more everything you do is a dharmic act. It's the way it is. Namaste. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you. <laughs>